you have your Bible, would you turn with me to John chapter 17, John 17. This is supposedly the, the transcript of a radio conversation between a U.S. naval ship and the Canadian authorities off the coast of Newfoundland. It was released by the Chief of Naval Operations on November 10th, 1995. The transcript begins with the Americans radioing, please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. The Canadians radioed back, recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. The Americans, this is the captain of a U.S. Navy ship, I say again, divert your course. The Canadians, no, I say again, divert your course. The Americans, this is the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln the second largest ship in the U.S. Atlantic fleet. We're accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, numerous support vessels. I demand you change your course 15 degrees north. That's one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. The Canadians, this is a lighthouse. It's your call. That U.S. aircraft carrier almost engaged in a very misguided mission. Last month, when we were here in John 17, we saw that we as Christians are called to be on mission. That Jesus says, as I have been sent, I am sending you on a mission. So the question we have is, are we on the right mission? Are are we going on the correct mission, or is it a misguided mission. And we're going to see in, in the, today's passage here in John 17 that Jesus gives some clarification that not only does being on mission give us great joy, but now he brings in this theme of holiness. So we see, first of all, that being on mission requires being holy. Look again at verse 18. This is our key verse where Jesus talks about mission. He's praying to the Father and he says, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Our English word mission comes from the Latin missio, which means to send. So Jesus says, Father, as you have sent me on mission, so I am sending them on mission. Now what's interesting is that this verse about mission is actually sandwiched between two verses about holiness. Look now at verse 17. Jesus prays, sanctify. That's from the Greek root, to make holy. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then on the other side of our mission verse, on verse 19, and for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. The word sanctify is used three times in verses 17 and 19. And it means to set something apart to make it holy. Now let me give you a little bit of an illustration of what it means to set something apart, to sanctify something. When you are planning for your big wedding, one of the first things that you do is you go to a store, to a couple stores, and you register for bridal shower gifts, for wedding gifts, the different things that you're going to need as you're starting out your home. And so when my wife and I were getting married a long, long time ago, uh, she went and registered at Target. And, and she asked me, would you come with me to Target to help me register? And I thought, I don't really want to look at bedspreads and kitchenware and, and home goods. But she said, please. And because we weren't married yet, I was still trying to impress her. So I said, Yes. And so reluctantly, I went with her as the dutiful fiance. We go into Target, and the first place we went was to customer service, and there's this guy at the counter, and he he has us fill out some information at the kiosk, and then he slides a gun across the counter to me. It was a scanner gun. Uh, But but he says, look, you can take this gun, and, and anything that you want in the store, you just aim and shoot, and it'll show up on your registry. And so I thought, well, this, this isn't as bad as I thought. And so for the next hour and a half, we went around Target, and Carrie would point at something, and then I would kill it, execution style, <laughs> with a scanner gun, and it would go on our registry. And so I thought, well, this, this really isn't as bad as I was afraid of as we're going around the store, until all of a sudden, she stops, and we have this really weird conversation. She says, 
Look, when, when we register for things at Target, when we register especially for what we're going to have in the kitchen cupboards, I want you to remember that we're actually going to register for two different sets of cups and plates and silverware. And I just looked at her with this confused look, like, why in the world will we need two sets of these? And she said, well, we're going to need our, our first set will be our daily wear. And th these are the plates and the cups and, and the, the silverware that we'll use every single day. But the second set will probably register at Dillard's or Belt for something really fancy. And, and these plates will be made out of china. And these cups will be made out of crystal. And these, this silverware might even be plated with silver. It's, it's going to be a lot fancier than the first set. And I thought, why in the world would we need a whole nother set of silverware and, and, and daily wear? I still think, why in the world do we need another set of this stuff? <laughs> it just sits in this big cabinet in our dining room. And we never even touch it except when we move or dust it occasionally. You say, why would you do that? Well, the idea is that we're going to sanctify this fancy chinaware. We're going to, to set it apart only for very special uses. Like one day if the, the president ever shows up on our doorstep, we're going to be ready. <laughs> some, some people say, well, you can use it at Christmas or at New Year's or if you have kids. Never. You never get out that special that, that special china. It, it's been set apart. Some of you single guys are thinking, I, I just have three sporks and a plastic plate in my apartment. <laughs> well, get ready, because when, when you get engaged, you're going to have to start thinking these two different sets, one that you use and one that has been sanctified that's set apart for special use. Now, what's interesting is that here, Jesus says, I am sanctifying you but not just for some obscure, pointless use, not to sit on a shelf. I am setting you apart. I am sanctifying you to be on mission. He says your holiness is actually part of your mission. Jesus doesn't say, Father, I'm, I'm sending my followers into the world. Please give them a really good book on evangelism. Please give them a, a new method for witnessing. Give them a, a strategy for church growth. Jesus says, no, I am sending my followers on mission, and what I want you to give to them is holiness, that they might be sanctified, that they might be set apart, made holy. And this idea of a holy mission, of having holiness, personal holiness, as we go out on mission is probably no more imperative than in 2016. Because we live in a world that's postmodern. We live in a world where people, frankly, don't care about your truth. The, the question that they're asking when they look at your faith is not, is your faith true? The question that they're going to ask is, is your faith real? They don't care if you think you have the truth they care if, if your truth has you. They care if they see your truth changing you, making a difference in your life. A lot of times I'll hear Christians saying, oh, I'm so concerned about my family members. I want to see them come to Christ. I'm witnessing to them all the time, and that's good. Or I've got these kids or, or grandkids, and they're away from the Lord, and so I, I get out my Bible, and I've told them the truth so many different times. And I'll say, look, you know, it, it, it's good to give the truth that you believe, but it's even better to live the truth that you believe. It, it's much better if you're showing them the truth through the way that you live. Because it's one thing to hear about someone's personal beliefs over and over and over. It's something altogether different to see their personal holiness in their life. To see that it's real. That you're holy that you are dedicated all out to God. And I'm not, I'm not talking about that you put on this fake facade. When you come to church on Sunday, you're really pious in public. That will actually probably turn your, your kids and your family members and the people closest to you against your faith. 
Instead, I'm talking not about being a, a hypocrite in public, and then when you get home, you're selfish and angry and worried. It, 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 it's not saying that you're going to be perfect, but I'm saying, are you trying to actually pursue the holiness that we find in Scripture? Is your life characterized by someone who's pursuing holiness because your kids will see through your facade? Your wife, your family will see through a facade if that's what you're putting up in public. Are you pursuing holiness? Again, that doesn't mean that you're perfect, but when you fail, do you sincerely repent? Do you, do you apologize? Do you show them that you're trying to be like Christ? This is what attracted people to Jesus. It wasn't just his miracles. It was his moral beauty. That When they looked at Christ, they saw his love and his wisdom, his courage, his humility, his self-control, his patience, his joy, that he was unique, that he was altogether holy. And that made him altogether lovely. He says in verse 19 that he sanctified himself so that we might also be sanctified. Jesus wants us to go out on mission with the same holiness, the same moral beauty, the same commitment that attracted people to him because that attracts people to God. I mean, think about this. When, when, when someone tries to sell you on something, if it's not making a difference in their life, are you really going to buy into it? So let's say that tomorrow you're walking down the sidewalk and, and I, I realize it's cold season. I'm not trying, not trying to use the power of suggestion here, but you hear someone who's hacking and they're coughing and sputtering on the sidewalk. And so you see your friend and they're, they're kind of coughing and, and so you step back a little bit and they see you do that, but they, they get a smile on their face. They're still coughing and hacking and they, they pull out this throat lozenge and they extend it to you and they say, wow, these things are great. <coughs> they, they work wonders. You need to try these. How many of you are going to go to CVS and buy those cough drops? Or, or maybe you have a friend and their yard looks terrible. They have more weeds than they have grass. But one day they come to you and they say, hey, I really want to recommend this lawn care service. How many of you are going to take the card and call the number? Or, or you have a friend and they, they're just really not a good driver. They, they always seem to be getting in wrecks. And one day they come up to you and they say, hey, I've got some good driving tips. You want to hear them? I mean, if it's not making a difference in their life, in their health, in their yard, in their driving, why am I going to want what they have? And in the same way, how effective are we going to be as, as ambassadors of reconciliation? We are to be calling men to, to be reconciled, to be made at peace with a holy God if they don't see any holiness in our lives. The great preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, said, if I had a brother who had been murdered, what would you think of me if I daily consorted with the assassin who drove the dagger into my brother's heart? Surely I, too, must be an accomplice in the crime. Sin murdered Christ. Will you be friend to it? Sin pierced the heart of the incarnate God. Can you love it? Being on mission means being holy. If, if you say, we, we are the children of light, what do people expect to see in your life? Darkness? Light. If, if we call God Holy Father, what do our family members expect to see in our lives? Holiness. See, holiness is not just some, some strict rules, trying to look really austere and unattractive. Holiness is not looking like you drank apple cider vinegar for breakfast. That's not holiness. There is a moral beauty to holiness. There is something attractive that when people look at your life, they say, wow, that is amazing. Look at that person's love. Look at that person's joy. Look at that, that guy has peace that just, it's supernatural. It, it surpasses the world's understanding. When Jonathan Edwards, the great American thinker and theologian, was a young man he wrote this in his journal. He said, we are apt to think since childhood that, that holiness is melancholy, morose, sour, and an unpleasant thing. But it is the highest beauty. Are you living a life that is holy 
that is consistent because this is one of the fundamental ways that you will fulfill your mission. This is one of the primary ways that we point people to God. Now, unfortunately, there's been a big misunderstanding. Again, many people are very misguided in their mission, and so throughout church history, many Christians have wrongly thought that to be holy, you had to get as far away from the world as possible. And so they would cloister themselves away in in convents and nunneries, in monasteries, in Christian schools, in caves, And some literally would even make a home for themselves at the top of a pole. They called themselves the Pillarites. And if they were up on the top of the pole, living on this pole, they didn't have to associate with anyone. And they could literally look down on everyone. Is that the way that we are supposed to pursue holiness? Is it by retreating, trying to escape from the world? And we think, obviously, the answer is no. If we're called to be ambassadors... We have to go into the foreign country. If we're called to, to reconcile people to God, we have to, to bring, we have to come close to them. We have to make peace with them. We have to, to help them make peace with God. Being on mission, number one, requires being holy, but being on mission, number two, requires going into the world. Look at verse 14. Jesus, again, is, is praying to the Father. He says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they, referring to his followers, are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So, yeah, we as believers are not of the world. This is John's gospel. If we were to flip over to John's first letter, 1 John 2.15, John writes, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You cannot love the world and love the Father at the same time. You say, well, what does it look like to love the world? Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So so how are you of the world? You are of the world when you love the world. When you love the world more than you love God, You are of the world. Do you follow the the desires of your flesh? Now, these are not necessarily bad things. The desires of the flesh are usually God-given things. We, We have a natural desire for food. We have a natural desire for sex. Those things are not bad inside of God's plan. But when you say, you know what, I'm going to step outside of God's plan, all of a sudden now you've shown your hand that you love those things, you love the desires of your flesh more than you love God. Are you a glutton? Are you a drunk? Are you lazy? Are you living, are you pursuing the desires of your flesh? What about the desires of your eyes? Is it easy for you to look at your friend's house or your friend's car or your friend's beautiful kids or your friend's beautiful spouse or their easy job, or their perfect body, or their nice vacations, and and all of a sudden you feel that green-eyed monster of envy rearing its ugly head, and and, and you want those things. See, affluenza is far more deadly to Americans than AIDS. There are millions and millions of Americans who, no matter how much money they have, how many material things they have, how many possessions they have, we always want more. More. Do your eyes get you in trouble? Matthew 6.22 says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if the eye is clear, your whole body is full of light. If your eyes are content, if they're clear, then your body is going to be like a lamp shining forth the gospel of Christ. But if it's clouded, if it's green with envy, you're not going to be on mission. You're going to be of the world. It's interesting when John talks about the pride of life, There are many Christians who think that they are being holy by keeping a list of rules when oftentimes in that rule keeping, they're actually falling into the pride of life. They're so proud of their spiritual record, their own merits, their self-righteousness that they're doing the exact thing that, that John is warning against. They're being consumed with the pride of life. They're not loving the Father, they're loving the world. 
He says, so how do we quit being of the world? Does this mean we, we need to look for a cave or a convent or a monastery? Do we need to just get in our holy huddle in the, the nice, clean, sanitized walls of our campuses and our churches and, and just pray that the Lord will take us out of the world? It's interesting, if you look at the Old Testament, Moses prayed that very prayer. Elijah prayed that prayer. Jonah prayed that prayer. And every single time, what was God's answer? No. No, just as you should avoid assimilation, being of the world, Jesus says, on the other hand, you're not supposed to be out of the world. You're not supposed to pursue isolation. That is not holiness. He says, so then what is the goal of holy mission? It's insulation. Look at verse 15. Jesus says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, that they'd be isolated, but that thou shouldest keep them from. That, that you, Father, would insulate them from the evil. Jesus prays that we would not be taken out of the world. He doesn't want us to be isolated. I heard about a, a small church that was affiliated with a denomination that had split from a denomination from a denomination, and here you finally have this little splinter church, and these believers think that they have the truth. In fact, they were so confident of that that they went out, and for their church sign, they took gold letters, and they put up over their door, Jesus only. Now, that's pretty pious. Well, a few months later, there was a big storm, and in the storm, a gust of wind blew off the first three letters, and now it very, very accurately read, us only. That, that's what they thought, and that's how they treated the world. We, we are called not to be of the world, assimilated, nor are we called to be out of the world, isolated. You say, so then what is the answer? Verse 18, Jesus says, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. We are sent into the world. We are to be deeply engaged in the lives of the people around us. You say, but they don't look like me. They don't dress like me. They don't smell like me. They have all these, these struggles and sins and, and, and problems. We are called to go into their lives, into our community, with the gospel. Think of it this way. Imagine if, if you were a firefighter, and all of a sudden you're at your fire station, and the alarm goes off, and you throw on your gear, you jump in the truck, the, you, you turn on, the, the lights are flashing, the sirens are wailing, and you, and you speed to the site of this house fire. And as you get out of the truck, you see some of the neighbors and some family members are out on the front lawn, and they're screaming at you, and they're saying, there's a baby in the back of the house. And here you are, a firefighter, with all of your training and all of your gear, and you look at the house and you say, I don't know, that looks pretty hot. I mean, look at all those flames. Um, you know, I, I just, I really don't feel like going in there. And they say, but you have your gear on. You're, you're a firefighter. And you say, yeah, but do you know how much this gear weighs? This is like 80 pounds. And it's July. Do you know how hot that would be? I would be sweating like crazy. You know, I, I really don't want to get close to that fire. I, I don't like fire. I, I'm just going to isolate myself. I'll stand out here on the front lawn, and I'll spray some water on it. And at that point, these people, these family members are going to be pleading with you to go in to the fire to, to help rescue this little baby. But, but what if you just say, no, no, it looks, it looks too dangerous. I think I would be too uncomfortable. Now, your mission as, as a firefighter at that point is to go into the fire. Your mission is to rescue the perishing, not to be of the fire. You wouldn't go in there without your protective gear. That wouldn't do anyone any good. You, you need to be insulated from the fire, but at the same time, you can't isolate yourself from the fire and still fulfill your mission. And in the same way, Jesus says as Christians, our mission is to go into the world, 
to bring lost people to the Savior, to the rescuer. Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. We cannot fulfill our mission by isolating ourselves from the world. We can't be content, and it's very tempting to say, well, let's just hide behind the walls of our Bible-believing church, and let's put our kids in Christian school or homeschool, and if, if anyone comes in, we'll just make them feel unwelcomed and shunned because we don't want their worldly influence in our lives. We don't want their kids corrupting our kids. And we often do that in the name of holiness. But Jesus says, no, holiness is not trying to get out of the world. Holiness is not isolating yourself from the very ones I came to rescue, that I gave my life for. Don't you get it? Holiness is not trying to isolate yourself out of the world or assimilate yourself and become part of the world. It's going into the world insulated with holiness to make a difference, to show them the beauty of Christ, to show them the beauty of the one who died for them. You say, but, but it's dangerous, but it's not comfortable. It wasn't meant to be. It's like a firefighter going into the fire. They're insulated from the fire. They're separated by the, by the protective gear that they're wearing, just as we go into the world with holiness. But they have to go into the fire to fulfill their mission. You say, well, I, I, just, I just think that's too dangerous. I don't want to go into the world. Can, again, can you imagine a firefighter saying that? It's boggling when I look at firefighters, and here are men and women who go into, they charge into the place that everyone else is running out of. I remember watching a documentary on 9-11, and this was real footage of FDNY firefighters going into the World Trade Towers knowing what would happen. But that was their mission. That's their job as a firefighter. And this is why we, we have to be insulated by the protective suit of holiness. Holiness makes us different. Holiness separates us from the devouring flames of the world. In fact, imagine if you were in a burning building and, and you could feel the flames flickering around you. You're surrounded by flames. You're inhaling. You're starting to cough out the smoke. And all of a sudden, you see the silhouette of a person and you realize it's a civilian just like you. It wouldn't give you any hope. But what if two minutes later you see another silhouette and all of a sudden you realize this is a firefighter. This guy has protective gear that's separating him from the flames. This guy has an oxygen mask that's separating him from the smoke. Now I have hope. This is what the unsaved world should see when they see a Christian. They should see our holiness that we are separated from the devouring flames of the world by that holiness, that we are like Christ, that we can make a difference, that, that there is hope, that there is help when we come to them, that we are not isolated out of the world where they'll never see us, they'll never come in contact with us, nor are we assimilated of the world, but we are insulated by holiness. And this is the, the balance of a, the tightrope that we as Christians will walk the rest of our lives. Because it's very easy to, in our flesh, let ourselves become assimilated, to feed the lust of your flesh, the lust of your eyes, the pride of life. Or it's very easy to overreact like the Pharisees or the monks or the Pillarites and say, I'm just going to isolate myself and get as far away from the world as I can. But holiness is neither of those. It's not assimilation. It's not isolation. Holiness is insulation as we go on mission into the world. As we put on the gear of holiness found in Ephesians chapter 6, the spiritual armor of God that is designed to protect you against the wiles, the tactics, the fiery darts of the wicked one. But listen, you're going to have to put on that armor every single day because he is hunting you. He is a roaring lion who is stalking, who is seeking to devour you. But if you will daily put on Christ, put on this Christian armor, you will be insulated. You'll be able to go on mission. You'll be able to charge into the worst inferno 
with the holiness of Christ. You say, will it be dangerous? Yes. Will it be comfortable? No, you'll have to step way out of your comfort zone. But we are called to go on mission. And that requires going into the world to seek and to save those who are lost. Are you willing to go outside your comfort zone? Are you willing to get involved in the lives of sinners? You say, but it's messy. Yeah, but people are perishing. People are hurting. People are broken. There's a void in their lives that only Christ can fill. And this is why Christ has called us to go on mission. Will, will your neighbors, will your coworkers see a difference in your life? Because being on mission means being holy. And will they see a compassion, a Christ-like compassion in your life? Because being on mission means that you go into the world. Don't be assimilated of the world. Don't be isolated out of the world. Go into the world insulated with holiness. You're on a holy mission. Let's stand this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. There may be someone and you are here visiting and you, you look around and you think, I don't really think that I fit in. These people look so different than me. They look like they're ha they have their lives all together, dressed up in their formal clothes with their friends. They know when to stand up and the lyrics of the songs. They know just what they're doing. Maybe this morning you say, I, I feel like an outsider, but I, I see the heart of Jesus Christ in this passage, that I am called to be, to, to be part of, of his family, that Jesus Christ has called even his followers to come to people like me. Maybe there's someone who would say, I, I want to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I want to come to him this morning. If you just slip up your hand and I'll, I'm going to look for you. I'd like to pray for you this morning. If you'd say, I would like to come to Christ as my Savior. Maybe there are believers here this morning, and you would say, it's, it's easy for me to become assimilated with the world. And, and I find myself being drawn by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I find myself very easily going back to the same habits and thought patterns and, and lusts that controlled me before I even came to Christ. Or maybe you would say, I'm a believer, and I find myself very easily trying to overreact and isolate myself from the world. And I, I, I in my mind, have often thought of holiness in terms of just being completely isolated, being separated from the world completely, when in, in reality, it's, it's clear that Christ's idea of holiness is he is setting us apart for mission, that he has sanctified us so that we can go into the world with the good news of the gospel. And I need to do a better job as a believer of, of finding myself going into the world, going across the street to my neighbor, going across the, the work room or the break room to, the, to my friend, my coworker. And I need to be willing to involve myself in their lives and engage in their life for the sake of the gospel. I am a believer who wants to be on holy mission. Father, we are convicted as we look at the life and ministry of your son. We are convicted because we know that we could never be as righteous as he is, that it's only through his righteousness that we can even attempt to be holy as he is holy. Father, we are also convicted on the other side at how little we engage in the mission that you've called us to, at how often we find ourselves trying to, to make pious excuses for our lethargy, our apathy, our unwillingness to go to unsafe friends, that we, we stand back, we isolate ourselves, we stay in our comfort zones, and we call it holiness. Father, I pray that we would understand that your call to holiness is a call to mission, it's a call to go into the world. Father, I know that I personally struggle with, with having the courage and having the boldness and having the compassion that Christ had to take the time and to get our hands messy and to involve ourselves in the lives of the unsaved world around us. But I pray that you would give us that kind of heartbeat, that you would give us that kind of passion that Christ had 
that we would make a difference, that we would go into the world not to be of it, not to assimilate with it, but that we would go in insulated by the holiness of a, a walk with you, of a Christ-likeness that, it, that permeates our lives, that is seen, that is real, that the people around us see it and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Father, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for the holy mission that you've called us to. We thank you for the holiness that insulates us from the world, and we pray that even this week we would go into the world on a holy mission. We pray this in his name. Amen.